Hi YouTube, this is Annie Johnson. For full disclosure, I have just finished my explaining outlining while drunk video, which probably won't be named that because that seems like a mouthful, but we'll know, figure that out sober. The important thing for you watching this video right now to know is that I am still quite inebriated and I am going to be reading The Secret Garden in a severely inebriated state. I don't know, this might become my brand. We'll see. For those who don't want to go back and see my last video, this drink is called the 2020. It is absinthe and Red Bull at some ratio that isn't worth counting. I don't know. Needs, definitely needs more Red Bull though, because oh, man, is that, that's hard to get through. This is the secret garden, the strangest house. It was the sweetest, most mysterious looking place anyone could imagine. The high walls which shut it in were covered with leafless stems of climbing roses, which were so thick that they were matted together. Mary Lennox knew they were roses because she had seen a great many roses in India. All the ground was covered with grass of a wintry brown, and out of it grew clumps of bushes which were surely rose bushes if they were alive. There were numbers of standard roses which had spread their branches that they were like little trees. There were other trees in the garden, and one of the things which made the place look strangest and loveliest was that the climbing roses had run all over them and swung down long tendrils which made light swaying curtains. Here and there they had caught at each other or at far-reaching branches and had crept from one tree to another and made lovely bridges of themselves. There were neither leaves nor roses on them now, and Mary did not know whether they were dead or alive. But their thin gray and brown branches and sprays looked like a sort of hazy mantle spreading over everything, walls and trees and even brown grass, where they had fallen from their fastening and run along the ground. It was this hazy tangle from tree to tree which made it all so mysterious. Mary had thought it must be different from other gardens which had not been left all by themselves so long, and indeed it was different from any other place she had ever seen in her life. How still it is, she whispered, how still. Then she waited a moment and listened at the stillness. The robin who had flown to his treetop was still as all the rest. She did not even flutter his wings. He sat without stirring and looked at Mary. No wonder it is so still, she whispered again. I am the first person who has spoken here for 10 years. She moved away from the door, stepping as softly as, she, as if she were afraid of awakening someone. She was glad that there was grass under her feet and that her steps made no sounds. She walked under one of the fairy-like gray arches between the trees and looked up at the sprays of tendrils which formed them. I wonder if they are all quite dead, she said. Is it all a quiet, dead garden? I wish it wasn't. If she had been Ben Weatherstaff, she would have told whether the wood was alive by looking at it, and she could only see that there was only gray or brown sprays and branches and none showed any sign of even a tiny leaf bud anywhere. But she was inside the wonderful garden, and she could come through the door under the ivy any time she felt as if she had found a world all her own. The sun was shining inside the four walls, and the high arch of blue sky over this particular piece of Misthwaite Manor seemed more brilliant and soft than it was over the moor. I think I'm finally getting the hang of saying Misthwaite Manor. The robin flew down from his treetop and hopped about a few... hopped about. Obviously more drinking is needed. The robin flew down from his treetop and hopped about or flew from her from one brunt. Okay, I've tried this line five times. The robin flew down from his treetop and hopped about or flew after her from one bush to another. He chirped a good deal and had a very busy air as if he were showing her things. Everything was strange and silent, and she seemed to be hundreds of miles away from anyone, but somehow she did not feel lonely at all. All that tr troubled her was her wish that she knew whether the roses were dead, or if perhaps some of them had lived and might put out leaves and buds as the weather got warmer. She did not want it to be quite a dead garden. If it were quite a live garden, how wonderful it would be, what thousands of roses would grow on every side. 
Her skipping rope had hung over her arm when she came in, and after she had walked about for a while, she had thought she would skip around the whole garden, stopping when she wanted to look at things. There seemed to have been grass paths here and there, and in one or two corners there were alcoves of evergreen that stone seats or tall moss-covered flower urns in them. As she came near the second of these alcoves, she stopped skipping. There had once been a flower bed in it, and she thought she saw something sticking out of the black earth, some sharp little pale green points. She remembered when Ben Weatherstaff had said, and she knelt down to look at them. Yes, they might be tiny growing things, and they might be crocuses or snowdrops or daffodils, she whispered. She bent very close to them and sniffed the fresh scent of the damp earth, and she liked it very much. Perhaps there are some other ones coming up in other places, she said. I will go all over the garden and look. She did not skip, but walked. She went slowly and kept her eyes on the ground. She looked in the old border beds and among the grass, and after she had gone around trying to miss nothing, she had found ever so many more sharp, pale green points, and she had become quite ex excited again. It isn't a quite dead garden, she cried out softly to herself, even if the roses are dead and there are other things alive. She does not know anything about gardening, but the grass seemed so thick in some of the places where the green points were pushed their way through. She did not know anything about gardening. Mm. My throat's already starting to feel sore, so I feel like I need to drink more. I don't know what it is about this book, but reading it makes my throat sore. Like way more than just talking to the camera about random shit. It isn't quite a dead garden, she cried out softly to herself. Even if the roses are dead, there are other things alive. She did not know anything about gardening, but the grass seemed so thick in some of the places where the green points were pushing their way through that, that she thought they did not seem to have room enough to grow. She, she searched about until she found a rather sharp piece of wood and knelt down and dug and weeded out the weeds and grass until she made nice little clear places around them. Now they look as if they could breathe, she said, after she had finished with the other ones. I'm going to do ever, ever so many more. I'll do all I can see. If I haven't time today, I can come tomorrow. She went from place to place and dug and weeded and enjoyed herself so immensely that she led on from bed to bed into the grass under the trees. The exercise made her so warm that she first threw her coat off, then her hat, and without knowing it, she was smiling down on the grass and the pale green points all the time. The robin was tremendously busy. He was very much pleased to see gardening begun on his own estate. He'd often wonder, wondered at Ben Weatherstaff, where gardening is done all sorts of delightful things to eat are turn. What did that sentence just say? He had often wondered at Ben Weatherstaff, where gardening is done, all sorts of delightful things to eat are turned up with the soil. Now here was this new kind of creature who was not half Ben's size and yet had the sense to come into his garden and begin at once. A weird point of view shift, but I'll allow it. Mistress Mary worked in her garden until it was time to get her midday dinner. In fact, she was rather late in remembering, and when she put on her coat and hat and picked up her skirt rope, skip. In fact, she was rather late to remember in remembering, and when she put on her coat and hat and picked up her skipping rope, she could not believe she had been working two or three hours. She had been actually happy all the time and dozens and dozens of tiny pale green points were to be seen in cleared places looking twice as cheerful as they had looked before when the grass and weeds had been smothering them. So she discovered Kanmari's If It Sparks Joy, but early. I shall come back this afternoon, she said, looking all around at her kingdom and speaking to the trees and the rose bushes as if they heard her. Then she ran lightly across the grass, pushing open the slow old doors and slipping through it under the ivy. She had such red cheeks and such bright eyes and ate such a dinner that Martha was delighted. Two pieces of meat and two helps of rice pudding, she said, 
and mother will be pleased when I tell her the skipping rope's done for thee. In the course of her digging with her pointed stick, Mistress Mary had found herself digging up a sort of white root like an onion. She had put it back in its place and patted the earth carefully down in it, and just now she wondered if Martha could tell her what it, what, what it was. Martha, she said, what are those white roots that look like onions? They're bulbs, said Martha. Lots of spring flowers grow from them. The very little ones are snowdrops and crocuses, and the big ones are narcissuses and junquils and daffodils. Daffodillies. The biggest of all is lilies and purple flags. Eh, they are nice. Dickens got a whole lot of them planted in our bit of garden. Does Dickens know all of them? asked Mary, a new idea taking possession of her. Our Dickens can make a flower grow out of a brick walk. M Mother says he just whispers things of the ground. Dickens is a witch. Just saying. No judgment. Do bulbs live a long time? Would they live years and years if no one helped them? inquired Mary anxiously. There are things as help themselves, said Martha. That's why most poor folk can afford to have them. If you don't trouble them, most of them will work away underground for a lifetime and spread out and have little ends, and there's a place in the park woods here where there's snowdrops by thousands. They're the prettiest sight in the Yorkshire where in the spring comes no one knows when they m was first planted. I wish the spring was here now, said Mary. I want to see all the things that grow in England. She had finished her dinner and gone to her favorite seat in the hearth rug. I wish, I wish I had a little spade, she said. Whatever does the want with a spade for, asked Martha, laughing. Aren't they going to, to digging? I must tell mother that too. I mean, of course she's going to digging. What else do you use a spade for? Mary looked at the fire and pondered a little. She must be careful if she meant to keep her secret kingdom. She wasn't doing any harm, but if Mr. Craven found out about the open door, he would be fearful angry and got, get a new key and lock it up forever. She really could not bear that. Okay, just like the other day she was talking about how she like had no concept of people being angry at her and what the fuck. Mm. This is such a big place, she said slowly, as if she were turning matters over in her mind. The house is lonely, and the park is lonely, and the gardens are lonely. So many places seem shut up. I never did, ma I never did many things in India. But there were more people to look at, natives and soldiers marching by and sometimes bands playing and my ayah told me stories. There is no one to talk to here except you and Ben Weatherstaff and you have to do your work and Ben Weatherstaff won't speak to me often. I thought if I had a little spade I could dig something as he does and I might make a little garden if he could give me some seed. Martha's face quite lighted up. There now, she explained. If there wasn't one of the things Mother says, she says, there's such a lot of room in the big place you won't do the big... Why don't they give her a big for herself? Even if she doesn't play nothing but parsley and radishes, she dig and rake away and write down happy over it. Them was the very word she said. I hope them was the very word she said, because I don't know what the fuck I just read. Were they, said Mary? How many things she knows, doesn't she? Eh, yes, said Martha, it's like she says, a woman as brings up twelve children learns something besides her ABC. Children's as good as arithmetic to set in you finding out things. How much would a spade cost? A little one, Mary asked. Well, was Martha's reflective answer. At Thwaite Village there's a shop or so, and I say little garden sets with a spade and a rake and a fork all tied together for two shillings. And they was stout enough to work with, too. I've got more than that in my purse, said Mary. Mrs. Morrison gave me five shillings, and Mrs. Medlock gave me some money from Mr. Craven. Did he remember thee that much? explained Mar Martha. Mrs. Medlock said I was to have a shilling a week to spend. 
She gave me one every Saturday. I don't know what to spend it on. My word, that's rich, said Martha, that can buy anything in the world that wants. Really? Anything in the world? Like super yachts full of hookers and blow? I don't think that's going to go for a shilling. The rent of our cottage is only one three pence, and it's like pulling eye teeth to get it. Now I just thought of something, putting her hands on her hips. What? said Mary eagerly. My word, that's rich, said Martha. That can buy anything in the world that I want. The rent of the cottage is only one and three pence, and it's like pulling eye teeth to get it. Now I just thought of something, putting her hands on her hips. I don't know why I'm putting my hand on my chin to mimic hips, but... What, said Mary eagerly, in the shop at Thwaite, they sell a package of flower seeds for a penny each, and our Dickon, he knows which is the prettiest one and how to make them grow. He walks over the, to Thwaite many a day just for the fun of it. Does the know how to print letters, sudden, print letters suddenly? Suddenly? I guess she said that suddenly. I know how to write, Mary answered. Martha shook her head. Our Dickon can only read printing. If that could print, we could write a letter to him and ask him to go and buy the garden tools and the seeds at the same time. Oh, you're a good girl, Mary cried. You are, really. You don't know you were so nice. I know I can print letters if I try. Let's ask Mrs. Medlock for a pen and ink and some paper. I got some of my own, said Martha. I bought them so I could print a bit of letter to mother. For I bought them so I could print a bit of letter to mother of Sunday. I'll go and get them. She ran out of the room, and Mary stood by the fire and twisted her thin little hands together with sheer pleasure. Wait, Martha bought these but doesn't know how to write? I'm, I'm confused. She ran out of the room, and Mary stood by the fire and twisted her thin little hands together with sheer pleasure. If I had a spade, she whispered, wrong accent. If I had a spade, she whispered, I can make the earth nice and soft and dig up weeds. And if I have seeds, I can make a flower grow. The garden won't be dead at all. It'll be, it'll, it will come alive. Why is that so hard? She did not go out again that afternoon because when Martha returned with her pen and ink paper, she was obliged to clear the table and carry the plates and dishes downstairs when she had gotten to the kitchen. Mrs. Medlock was there and told her to do something, so Mary waited for what seemed to her a long time before she came back. Then it was a serious piece of work to write to Dickon. Mary had been taught very little because her governesses had disliked her too much to stay with her. She could not spell particularly well, but she found she could print letters when she tried. This was the letter Martha dictated to her. My dear Dickon, this comes hoping to find you well as it leaves me at present. Miss Mary has plenty of money and will go to Thwaite and buy her some flower seeds instead of garden tools to make a flower bed. Pick the prettiest ones and easy to grow because she has never done it before and lived in India, which is different. Not unpacking that. I am not unpacking that. Give my love to mother and every one of you. Miss Mary is going to tell me a lot more so that on my next day out, you can hear about elephants and camels and gentlemen being hunting lions and tigers. Your loving sister, Martha Phoebe Sowerby. Sowerby? That, that feels a little too heavy-handed. We'll put the money in the envelope and I'll get the butcher boy to take it in his cart. He's a great friend, Dickens, said Martha. How shall I get the things when Dickon buys them? He'll bring them to you himself. He'll like to walk over this way. Oh, exclaimed Mary, then I shall see him. I never thought I should see Dickon. I horribly feel a romantic subplot brewing, and I'm, I'm afraid of it. Does the want to see him, said Martha suddenly, for Mary had looked so pleased. Yes, I do. I never saw a boy foxes and crows loved. I want to see him very much. Martha gave a, gave a little start as if she remembered something. Now to think, she broke out, 
to think of me for getting that there and I thought I was going to tell you first thing this morning I asked mother and she said she'd asked Mrs. Medlock her own self Martha sounds as drunk as I am do you mean Mary began what I said Tuesday ask her if you might be driving over to our cottage someday and have a bit of mother's hot oat cake and butter and glass of milk seemed as if all the interesting things were happening in one day to think of going over the moor to the daylight and when the sky was blue to think of going into the cottage which held 12 children does she think mrs medlock will let me go she asked quite anxiously i think she, i she thinks she would she knows what a tidy woman mother is and how clean she gets the cottage if i went <laughs> if i went I should see your mother as well as Dickens, said Mary, thinking it over and liking the idea very much. She doesn't seem to be like the mothers in India. Oh, I feel this is super racist again. Okay, I'm going to go into it. Her work in the garden and the excitement of the afternoon ended by making her feel quite and thoughtful. Quiet and thoughtful. Martha stayed with her until tea time. But they sat in comfortable quiet and talked very little. But just before Martha went downstairs for the first tea tray, Mary asked a question. Okay, it didn't go super racist, but I feel there's a little racism just on the side there. Martha, she said, has the scullery maid had the toothache again today? Martha startled slightly. What makes thee ask that, she said. Because when I waited so long for you to come back, I opened the door and walked down the corridor to see if you were coming. And I heard that far-off cry again, just as we heard it the other night. There isn't a wind today, so you see it couldn't have been the wind. Eh, said Martha restlessly. They mustn't go walking about in the corridors and listening. Mr. Craven wouldn't be that that they're angry there's no mr craven would be that they're angry there's no knowing what he'd do that excuse sounded so thin that it didn't grammatically make sense i wasn't listening said mary i was just waiting for you and i heard it that's three times my word that there's Miss Medlock's bell, said Martha, and she almost ran out of the room. It's the strangest house anyone ever lived in, said Mary drowsily as she dropped her head to the cushioned seat of an armchair near her. Fresh air and digging and skipping rope had made her feel so comfortably tired that she fell asleep. For me, it's absinthe that's making me fall asleep. But you do you, Mary. You do you. Okay, analysis of that last chapter. I got nothing. Fuck these analyses. All analysis is false. Um, you're not going to pass your English essay. I'm sorry. But there's not much to go on other than what we see every chapter. Being healthy is good. I don't know. very strong drink and I have this much left to go.